All right, so now we know from 2.6 how to predict if things are going to come together in an ionic compound or as a molecule. We finished chapter two by learning about chemical nomenclature, which is not only now to predict how they come together, but to name the thing that is produced. And the first step in naming uh, is to figure out exactly what we have because we have different sets of rules for naming each type of thing. Okay. So what is nomenclature, right? Collection of rules for naming things because a compound could, by, could be identified by both its name, right, if you hear it spoken, or its formula, if you see it written. And sometimes to go shorthand, we just say the formula, right? Saying CO2 instead of carbon dioxide. So the first thing we are going to learn to name are ionic binary compounds, then polyatomic ions, then molecules and acids. So there are four sets of rules that you'll need to pay attention to throughout 2.7. Ionic compounds are largely the easiest, which is why we're starting there, okay? focusing on inorganic substances, meaning there's no carbon. And those follow the nomenclature rules from IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. That's the set of rules we'll be using for everything in 2.7. And how do we name a binary ionic compound? It's simple. We name the cation first, the thing that has the positive charge, and then the anion, the thing with the negative charge. And we name them by just putting the cation and the anion names together. The cation is just named as the atom is. Okay? So it doesn't matter if it's neutral sodium or Na+, it's still just sodium. The anions, though, do get changed a little bit. Okay? When we have that negative charge to make it an anion, we add the suffix ide, ide. Okay? And polyatomic ions are just named as the ion itself. Okay? So really, it's just this middle rule here that's tricky. And ions get IDE. Okay. So monatomic cations, right? we just name it as the atom. So this is sodium, this is calcium, this is boron. The anions are where we have to add that suffix. So notice these are all negatively charged. This isn't chlorine anymore with a negative charge, it's chloride, sulfide, nitride. Okay. But if they're negatively charged polyatomic ions, it's just the name of the ion piece of cake. So phosphate, carbonate. And then to name a compound with a cation and an anion together, you just say those two names in a row, the cation and then the anion. So here's a bunch you can do for practice. Okay. Taking a couple at random, this would be lithium chloride, magnesium nitride, sodium oxide. You can pause the video here, try it for practice. And then the answers are on the following slide right here. You've got the lecture slides available to you on Blackboard as well. Make sure you do those for practice and you know how to name these guys. Okay. And in each case, you should notice that the overall charge is neutral. We covered that in a previous video. Right? If they come together in a one-to-one -one ratio, great. But if the charge on the cation is not equal to the charge on the anion, then we need to add together the proper number to balance it out. Like calcium has a plus two charge, phosphide has a minus three charge, so that has to be Ca3P2. CAP, one to one, wouldn't exist because it's not neutral. And that's the nice thing about ionic compounds. They only come together in one way to, get elect to be electrically neutral overall. Here's some more examples with polyatomic ions. I again recommend you pause the video and practice them or do it on your own time with the Blackboard notes. You have the uh, examples and the answers to follow. Make sure you know the names of those polyatomic ions. Now, if we have a transition metal, then it gets a little bit trickier. And you may recall from a previous video, Right, that transition metals can have multiple charges. Okay. So if we have a transition metal, which will always be the cation, okay, you'll never have transition metals that are negatively charged. So the transition metal is always going to come first. But if you have that, you have to specify the charge of the transition metal 
And we do that in the name by putting the charge using Roman numerals in parentheses. So make sure you know your Roman numerals, one through five, and I, 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 three I's, I, V, and then V for five. And then notice, right, FeCl3 is iron three chloride. H2O, mercury one oxide. You have to specify the charge on these because it's the only way to know if you're given the name. You can't just say iron chloride because FeCl2 also exists. Okay, that would be iron two chloride. And again, what's in here in Roman numerals does not have to do with the anion. It is the charge on the cation. So how do I figure that out? Okay, I know chlorine only forms a minus one anion. And because there are three chlorines for that one iron, that must mean the iron is plus three. Okay, versus down here, right? Oxygen, I know, forms a minus two ion. And because there's two mercuries for that one oxygen, the oxygen's minus two, the mercuries themselves must be plus one each. Okay. So there are two others down there for you to again pause the video and practice. And we have the answers to follow. So that's all the rules for binary ionic compounds. No if it's plain old ionic compound, know if it has a polyatomic, and know if it has a transition metal. Okay. Those are the two special situations. What about molecular compounds? When we have molecules, they're named using a different set of rules because unlike ionic compounds where they only come together in one ratio, right, when we have covalent bonding and electrons being shared, there are multiple different ratios that we can form. So when we're naming a molecule, somewhere in the name, we have to specify the ratio that's occurring. How do we do that? Okay. Well, we start by naming the thing that's more metallic. Again, we're just looking at binary compounds. So we're comparing two things. The one that's more metallic is, is either further to the left or further down the periodic table. That's the thing that we name first followed by the one that's more non-metallic going up and to the right. Okay. But the one that's non-metallic, again, gets the IDE ending. Okay. So that's sounding similar to what we had before. The difference here is that the number of each of the atoms have to be designated using Greek prefixes. Because okay. I can't just say carbon oxide because there's a big difference between carbon dioxide, which you breathe in and out daily, and carbon monoxide, right, which would be toxic to you. So that's why we need to have those Greek prefixes. Um, and here's what those are. Okay. Mono for one, di for two, tri for three, so on and so forth, up to 10. Okay. Now, the only thing to note is notice I didn't say, you know, for CO2, monocarbon dioxide. If the very first thing that would come in the name is mono, it gets omitted. So if the thing that's more metallic, there's just one of them, you don't have to put mono. But you'll always have a prefix for whatever comes second. Okay. However, if you had something like uh, P2O5, okay, P2O5, that would be diphosphorus pentoxide. Okay. There, because there's two phosphorus to start, we do have a prefix at the beginning. That's the only other thing to look out for, but if you have two adjacent vowels, we usually end up dropping the A. And then of course, there are always situations where we tend to use common names more often, right? You don't typically hear somebody saying dihydrogen monoxide, right? you just say water. And that's okay in the sciences. Here are a lot of examples to start. Okay. SO2, sulfur, just stay sulfur, two oxygens, dioxide, BCL3, boron, trichloride. Take another one down here, N2O4, two nitrogens, so it's dinitrogen tetroxide. Again, I recommend you pause the video, try the others for practice, and make sure you know those prefixes for your exam. 
Lastly, we need to know how to name acids. You know, some things that contain hydrogen are have a different set of behavior in aqueous solution. They're known as acids. Okay, it's because they release the hydrogen ions in the form of H plus when they're in an aqueous solution, a solution with water. Okay. So we give them a special name to denote that property. This is the last entry on your list of how to name things, right? You've got inorganic compounds, ionic compounds with a subset for transition metals and for polyatomics. We just finished molecules and we're finishing here with acids. Okay. So if you're naming a binary acid with two things, right? instead of naming it like a molecule, we change the word hydrogen at the beginning to hydro. We add ick on the end of the other element that's not hydrogen. And then we say acid at the end. Yep. So here's some examples of those. Instead of HF as a gas, that's just hydrogen fluoride. But as an acid, that AQ means aqueous, means it's in water. Now it's hydrofluoric acid. And you've probably heard of hydrochloric acid. Three more there where you can pause the video for practice. And there are the answers to those as well. Many acids are also oxyacids. So this builds on what we discussed previously in oxyanions in 2.6. Okay. Oxyacids have hydrogen, oxygen, and one other element. Okay, it's a polyatomic ion as part of the acid itself. So how do we name those? Well, those ones are even easier because they don't include hydrogen or hydro at all. We just drop that completely. We just start with the root name of the atom that's in the polyatomic anion. And if that polyatomic was previously an eight, it becomes ick. If it was previously an ite, it becomes us, O-U-S. And then we just add the word acid at the end. So that's how we go from acetate to acetic acid, nitrate to nitric acid. Here, because this is nitrite, that'll go to nitrous acid because the ITE becomes an OUS. And again, you can pause the video here and practice these on your own. And that's how we name our oxy acids. Okay. I strongly recommend you don't just go through this video as quickly as possible and then move on with your life. You will need to know how to name things, these things. So either use the slides in the video or go on Blackboard and access the lecture materials that way and practice these. Then you can grade yourself and if you get things wrong, you can figure out why. Yep. We finished nomenclature with an example test question. Yep. Here's something you could expect on an exam, multiple choice type question. Ask us the name of N2O4 and what it is. So what that thing is, an ionic compound or a molecular compound is easier. N2O4, nitrogen is a nonmetal, oxygen is a nonmetal. When two nonmetals come together, they form a molecule. So it must be a molecular compound that leaves us between answer B and answer D. Then we look at the names, N2O4, two nitrogens. It must be dinitrogen tetroxide. Right. Nitrogen dioxide is NO2. That's a different type of molecule. Okay. So the final answer to this one is D. Make sure you know all the different naming rules from 2.7. And again, that continuation from 2.6, how to predict if things are ionic or molecular. And that concludes chapter two.